The trigonometric functions are remarkably useful. They show up everywhere, in calculus, complex numbers, and even physics. But there is one problem. For example, sine of sine inverse x is x, but sine inverse sine x is not x. What on earth is going on here? To explain why, we first need to talk about one-to-one -one functions. Just a disclaimer, for anyone who knows about codomains, for this video, every function I discuss will have its codomain equal to its range. If you don't know about codomains, don't worry, it's not that important for this video. Okay, so what is a one-to-one -one function? A one-to-one -one function satisfies the property that each y in its range comes from exactly one x in its domain. Basically, each output that is possible comes from exactly one input. You're not allowed to have an output that comes from two inputs, or three, or four, etc. For the purposes of this video, a one-to-one -one function is always going to be invertible. Basically, every output comes from exactly one input. So you can go from an output to the input which caused it without any ambiguity. For example, e to the x. If you have e to the a is equal to e to the b, which means these outputs are the same, it actually means the inputs are the same as well. a has to be equal to b. But if you have a squared equals b squared, it doesn't actually mean that a equals b, because a could be minus b as well. So x squared is not an invertible function, but e to the x is invertible. This might make more sense if you look at it graphically. Basically, an invertible function needs to pass the horizontal line test. To pass the test, any horizontal line you put on the graph has to cross the graph at most once. It's not allowed to cross the graph twice or three times, etc. It's pretty clear that for e to the x, it's not possible for a horizontal line to cross the graph more than once. So it passes the horizontal line test. If we look at the graph of x squared, we can see why it fails the horizontal line test. For example, look at this horizontal line. It clearly crosses the graph twice, which is obviously more than once. As long as it's possible for a horizontal line to cross the graph more than once, the function fails the horizontal line test. And that means it's not invertible. Okay, now we're going to the trig functions. I'll just introduce some notation that I'm going to be using. Trig of x is going to be defined as any of the trig functions, sine x, cos x, or tan x. That's just a way for me to do it generally without talking about one specific trig function. And now let trig d be the restriction of trig to the domain d where it is invertible. What does that mean? Basically, just look at the trig graph, but only for this specific domain, meaning a specific allowed x values, in which it's actually invertible. What's important to note here is trig d of x is equal to trig x for any x in the domain d. Why is that? Well, we've just defined trig d as identical to the trig graph, but only for this domain. So the actual rule of the function, how it assigns inputs to outputs, is the same, except we're just considering specific inputs. Okay, this will make a bit more sense if we look at it graphically. This is the graph of sine x, and as you can see, it's possible to put a horizontal line on the graph and have it cross more than once, so it fails the horizontal line test and it's not invertible. But we still need an inverse function of some sorts, so how do we do it? We restrict the domain only to this interval which is from minus pi on 2 to pi on 2. And we define this function as sine d of x. As you saw, it's identical to sine of x for this domain. It should be clear now that this graph does pass the horizontal line test, meaning we can invert it. We'll get to that later. Let's do it for cosine. Once again, you can see that it fails the horizontal line test, but we can actually choose the interval 0 to pi and restrict the graph to this domain, giving us cos d of x. And now it passes the horizontal line test, so we can invert it. Same idea for tan, it fails the horizontal line test, so we restrict it to this middle branch, minus pi on 2 to pi on 2. And we don't include the endpoints, by the way, because for tan, it's not defined at these endpoints. So these are the restricted versions of the trig functions. And notice that for sine, the domain d is minus pi on 2 to pi on 2. For cos, the domain d is 0 to pi. And for tan, the domain d is minus pi on 2 to pi on 2, excluding the endpoints. Hopefully you understand now why we've defined trig d of x as equal to trig x for this domain d, which depends on the trig function, by the way. Now, these functions, trig d, are all invertible, so we can take the inverse. It turns out the notation trig inverse 
is actually used to express trig D inverse. That is, trig inverse is the inverse of trig D, not trig. That notation might seem kind of weird, but that's just how it is. Basically, trig inverse is the inverse of the restricted trig function. What you should know about a function and its inverse is that the range of one is the domain of the other, and the domain of one is the range of the other. Okay, let's look at it graphically once again. These are the trig D functions, the restricted trig functions. We can take the inverse by plotting y equals x and reflecting each graph about y equals x, which basically swaps y and x. So these are the trig D inverse functions, and based on definition, these are also the inverse trig functions. Yes, sine inverse, cos inverse, and tan inverse. Because trig D and trig inverse are inverse functions of each other, we can compose them in any way to get back x. But if possible, we want to write these in terms of only trig. That is, we don't want to talk about trig D. How do we do that? We remember the fact that trig D of x is identical to trig of x for x in D. And we have this first equation is trig D of something. That something is trig inverse. Is trig inverse in the domain D? Well, we know that the range of trig inverse is the domain of trig D, which is D. So yes, trig inverse is in D, and that means we can change this first equation to just trig of trig inverse. This first identity is extremely useful. Okay, now how about the second one? We use the exact same idea for the second one, but the thing is we don't know whether x is in D. So all we do is we just add this condition and that means we have trig inverse trig x is equal to x for x in D. Basically, trig inverse acts as the inverse of trig, but only for the domain D, which is why in that domain, you can compose them in this way and just get back x. If you understand these two formulas, you definitely understand inverse trigonometry. Okay, let's look at a cool way to find trig inverse trig x in general. Let's just look at it for sine. How would you find the general formula for this? Well, you would first let it be some pronumeral theta, because it's an unknown. And then you can do operations on it, such as taking sine of both sides. Remember, sine of sine inverse can cancel out nicely every time, so we get sine x equals sine theta. If you know the general solutions, this is immediately done. And if you don't know them, just watch the video in the description. So we have theta is equal to this expression. So that means sine inverse sine x is this. You can do a similar thing for cosine and tangent giving us these two formulas. But if you wanted to find sine inverse sine of a specific number, then I would suggest doing it this way. Basically, we want to write sine 77 pi on 4 as sine theta, where theta is some number in minus pi on 2 to pi on 2. Because in this domain, sine inverse and sine act as inverse functions, and we can cancel them to get back that theta. Okay, so how do we find the theta? We just use trig identities. 77 on 4 is 19.25. So we can split it up like this, giving us 19 pi plus pi on 4. Sine has a period of 2 pi, so you can add any integer multiple of 2 pi to the input without changing the output. When you have sine pi plus something, you can simplify it by writing it like this and using the fact that sine pi minus x is sine x. That's the quickest way, giving us sine minus pi on 4. Okay, so we're computing sine inverse sine of minus pi on 4. Minus pi on 4 is in the domain D for sine, which is minus pi on 2 to pi on 2. And that's why we simply get minus pi on 4 back. That was just a quick example, but here are three more for you to try. Don't be scared by them and don't give up straight away if things are not going well. All you have to do is use these basic trig identities. Just mess around with these identities, try different things, I'm sure you can do it. If you enjoyed this video or learned something new, please consider subscribing. I'm trying to get to 1k by the end of the month, which is like one day, so I would really appreciate it. Thanks for watching.